Yes, I think, you know, there's quite a few, but one of the big things that's been tackled within the past few years is we haven't had multiple mechanisms of action when you think about treating patients with Crohn's disease. We had sort of a revolutionary era in 1998 when we saw the introduction of an anti-TNF therapy, but then we had this large period of time between 1998 and 2014 where we only had anti-TNF therapies. But if you look at what's happened in the past couple of years, you've seen this explosion of different mechanisms of action. That being said, we still have, if you hear everybody that gives a podium talk, a therapeutic ceiling where we just can't break through that. So we're always trying to think about how can we treat patients more effectively? How can we get drugs to patients earlier in the disease process? Um, and that, I think, is where we think about unmet needs. So it's, it's finding the right patient, getting access for that patient to therapy, and find the right mechanism of action to most efficiently treat their disease as early as possible. Those remain unmet needs. And I think that in the current era, we're still trying to struggle with that, even, even as many methods as we have. Well, I think a couple of different things. I think when we have new mechanisms like the IL-23 and form of Mirakizumab available, that does change the landscape because when we think about having these therapies that we can introduce first line and we don't have to rely just on the anti-TNF therapy, we can begin to think about sort of stratifying that patient who is right for an anti-TNF therapy, who's right for an anti-IL-1223, or who's right for a therapy like Mirakizumab. And so I think that that does begin to sort of bridge those gaps that we talked about because there may be a patient that's right for each of those types of therapies. And then I think you can start to think about like, what is that individual patient that's right in front of you? What's value to them? And how are you going to sort of make that decision? What's really important, and you have to think about this for any patient at the very beginning is, you know, efficacy should win out over everything. You have to have a drug that works because at the end of the day, that's what's going to make the most different to that patient, both in the next couple of weeks, but also in the long-term history of having Crohn's disease. And so any decision that we make, it's going to be really important to know that that drug's an effective drug, safe drug, and it's going to work to treat their disease. And that's why I think having Miracle is not approved and having some of the results that we're here talking about at Crohn's Class Congress is really exciting. Well, I think one of the most important things that's been presented with the Vivid 2 data is this is longer term data than we previously had with Vivid 1. So you had this, you know, open label extension that sort of rolled out for the next 52 weeks. So here we're presenting data out to one, week 104. So another year of data where you start to see the real signals of durability of Mirakizumab, which is something that we sort of have suspected about IL-23s, but really when you see that durable remission signal, because all of these patients were responders, endoscopic responders at week 52 that then rolled into that open label extension. And so a couple of important things when you think about durability, you had patients that, you know, roughly 80% of patients that were in clinical remission that stayed in clinical remission, but you start also to see some really important signals because all the patients were endoscopic responders. There was also a group of patients that weren't in endoscopic remission though. And in the second year of therapy, actually about a third of patients that were not in, in endoscopic remission then subsequently became in endoscopic remission by that week 104 mark. So that would suggest that not only is this a durable therapy, but you continue to see sort of an effectiveness that even those late comers can actually catch up and, and get into remission. I think that's really important when you think about what I was saying before is we had to think about efficacy first. And you got this efficacy signal that was there by week 52 that continued all the way out for another year. And then we saw no new safety signals, which we wouldn't really expect because we know that the IL-23 mechanism is, is relatively safe overall. And we've seen that across you know, multiple IL-23 therapies. And that just confirmed that you know even more with another year of data. So I thought that's a really important way to frame those conversations with patients. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just to be a little bit more blunt about that, no, there were no new safety concerns that were outside the mechanism of an IL-23 and specifically what's known about the Mirakizumab profile, both in Crohn's disease and previously as it's been studied in ulcerative colitis. So no new signals that were identified in another year of therapy in the Vivid 2 study.